All right, guys, what's going on? This is Ben Herstic back at you once again with another episode of the Armchair Arm Dragger Podcast. This is episode number 13, and it's been a really quiet week wrestling-wise, it seems. We've had Raw and SmackDown, AEW going about it on way. The G1 Climax is happening. That's the biggest thing going on right now. It's like the week before SummerSlam is always kind of quiet. Like, you, you know stuff is happening, but nothing, like, major is going on. Uh, so it's going to be a somewhat short one, I think, this week. We'll see. Next week's probably going to be a little long, because there's going to be TakeOver Toronto and uh, SummerSlam predictions. So let's get to the uh, Twitter handles and social media follows and all that stuff I, you should do, because everywhere I go, I try to bring... A positive energy about pro wrestling. I know some people don't like certain aspects of pro wrestling. I try to put a light spin on it, as always. Um, I am on Twitter myself at Churo Solider. Uh, you can follow this podcast at Podcast Armchair. And you can follow All Things Combat, which is the website I write for, at Things Combat on Twitter. We cover a wide variety of professional wrestling, boxing, and MMA. We are still going with our SummerSlam review series. Today, again, I'm recording this on a Wednesday this week, um, the 2013 one came out, we should have them all up, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. if the math works out right, it might, it should, I'm hoping it does, uh, we will have a review of every single SummerSlam before uh, this year's SummerSlam up. Uh, we, I also do have some articles in the works. I have three that I have ideas for. One I'm working on currently. Uh, one I still have to watch a lot of footage for. And one I had to figure out a way to make it interesting. But that's the, those are those. Uh, like I said, they are Things Combat on Twitter. And I mentioned this last week. I'm probably going to mention it from now until I graduate from college in the spring. I am the sports editor for The Cauldron at Cleveland State University. And you can follow them on Twitter at CSU Cauldron. We will be covering a little bit of everything that goes on all all around uh, Cleveland State's campus and downtown. Uh, I myself will be talking about sports. I've been looking into the new basketball coach we've hired. So that's something worth looking into. Uh, I don't want to go into about it too much on here because this is pro wrestling related, not college basketball related. I would like to start a sports one soon, maybe before Brown season, maybe... Just just before it starts, I don't have a name for it yet. I don't know if I can afford to do it. It's It all depends on time management, which I'm sometimes good at, sometimes not. So, we'll see. Um, but yeah, I'll be covering sports there. Just like last year, I covered sports for them. I'll be talking about all the going-ons in sports on campus. Like I said, we just hired a basketball coach. Um, I know volleyball is probably going to be good again this, this season coming up. Um... Soccer is always a big cover one. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, you can follow us at CSU Cauldron. And be fr- be sure to interact with any any of these that you find interesting. Myself, this podcast, All Things Combat or CSU Cauldron, or The Cauldron at CSU. Uh, just interact with us. We're, all on, we're always on Twitter. We always try to stay interactive and talk to um, everybody that we can, which is always a lot of fun. It's no fun to have a Twitter account if you have nobody to interact with. So, interact with us. Why not? Um, So, let's start with the G1 recap. I just caught up. I'm all cut up to night 11. Night 12 is going to be very interesting. I'm I'm torn on this because there's still a couple scenarios this way could go. Everybody in B block, I think mathematically, are still alive. I know... Outside of, um, so outside of Moxley, Ishii, and Juice Robinson, everybody else in B block is at four points. If if Moxley wins against Yano, everybody under four points who hadn't re- who wouldn't have wrestled yet that night, I'm pretty sure Moxley Yano is going to be somewhat early in the show. So Shingo Takagi, Taichi, Naito, Jeff Cobb. Hiroki Goto and Jay White are all pulling for Yano. How weird is that to say? I, I say this as a person per, personally. I'm not a fan of Yano. I don't. New, New Japan. I go for the seriousness and like the actual. Uh, uh, the, yeah, yeah. I still can't speak, and I'm a 22 year old man. What the hell is wrong with me? I go to New Japan for the seriousness. 
in the good wrestling. I don't go to it for a comedy skit. And I don't, don't get me wrong, Yano's a good wrestler. I don't I don't hate Yano. He's just, he's just not my personal cup of tea in pro wrestling. Um, and it's he's going against Moxley. They have to hope that Yano can beat Moxley. And it's the same story they're telling in both blocks. Moxley has a four-point lead. And Okada has a four-point lead over Kenta, Kota Ibushi, and Hiroshi Tanahashi. Right now, Moxley only has a four-point lead over Ishii and Robinson and a six-point lead over everybody else. It, it seems like it's going to be the same story. Moxley's going to phase it, fall off. He's got... Who's he got left? He's got Juice. He's got Yano. He has... Goto and Jay White. He's got to lose three of those. And Ishii either need, if Ishii wins three, he takes the outright lead. If Robinson wins three, he takes the outright lead. Takagi, Yano, Taichi, Naito, Cobb, Goto, and White all have to have perfect tournaments from here on out. I could see Jay White maybe making the finals. They had him and Zack Sabre Jr. having the same story going into uh, night 11. I think it was. No, what, what night did Zack Sabre lose? Night 9. When he lost to... Evil? Was it Evil? I have it right here next to me. I think it... I know he, I know he lost to Evil. But when did he lose to Evil? He lost to Evil... Yeah, Night 9. Okay, I was right. Um, He's... So Sabre's eliminated. They both had the same story. Nobody had gone from 0-3 to win the tournament. So that could kind of be the story they're telling with, with Jay White now. He's going to at least be alive. He's Him and Naito facing each other on the final night. When that was announced, I'm like, okay, these two are going to be the ones fighting for the block win. The issue with Moxley leading the block for me, he's not under their contract. Going into this tournament, you knew Jeff Cobb wasn't going to win, and you could damn sure bet John Moxley was not going to win the G1. I'm not saying this because I don't like Moxley. He's just not somebody under New Japan contract. So I think they would think it's weird if somebody not under contract with New Japan won their biggest tournament of the year. And Okada leading the A block, it's it's always a thing with me. I, I put this on Twitter, and I think it's a true thing. Going forward, there should be no champion should not be in the tournament. So best of the Super Juniors, Junior Heavyweight Champ should not be in the tournament. IWGP or G1 Climax, the IWGP Heavyweight Champion should not be in the tournament. That way you can get the 20 best wrestlers that are not the champion fighting for that championship shot. Which I think would be a lot more interesting than the champion being in the tournament and taking up a spot. And also I think it's weird if a champion wins the whole tournament. Like, the, the whole thing going around is if Okada wins, he could probably he could call out Kenny Omega. Because Omega still technically is under New Japan contract, if I remember correctly. So, he he would call out Omega. I took this a step further. What if he calls out Omega and that Wrestle Kingdom Omega no-shows? Which I, I don't think Omega would show up. He's done in New Japan. He's done everything he wants to. He wants to go do something else. As as mixed as I am on all elite wrestling, I think, I think the one I'm most okay with is Kenny Omega because I don't trust Vince with the character. And that's that's for damn good reason. But I do I have been enjoying the G one. It's been great action every single night. There's been match of the year candidates all throughout. Um, Saber versus Will Osprey is a sleeper match of the tournament for me. People are gonna forget how good that match was come the final night of the tournament, and then you'll go back and watch and say, you know, that one might have been match of the tournament. But right now. I'm also kind of mixed on the, like I said earlier, I'm mixed on the tournament. It's been great to watch. It's been interesting to follow along the stories. And the way I watch wrestling, I try to think ahead. Like, okay, since this is happening, how is that going to affect this? Or since this person won, how is the story going to turn to revolve around this part? Where, with with me in thinking about that, I think about how how right I can be with WWE because it's more it's more predictable than New Japan and hopefully more predictable than all elite wrestling is going to be. But sometimes it's just annoying. And the main company 
the main, the main complaint I have with with them is their refusal to push anybody not named Kazuchika Okada or Will Ospreay or maybe Jay White. It's been two years. I don't know how big they are on Jay White yet. They kind of rushed him to the title scene because Omega left. I fully believe if Omega had re-signed, he would have lost the title to o- Okada at Madison Square Garden. It's it's a tough thing to think about, and I'm not sure how it would have played differently if the Elite had decided to stay. But right now I look at it, the one stable that always seems to get pushed to the back is LIJ, Los Ingobernables de Japón. If somebody was going to beat Moxley, the perfect person to do it, now I'm thinking it's going to be Yano, the perfect person to have beaten Moxley would have been Tetsuya Naito. And don't even, I, I ranted about this a couple weeks ago. Don't get me started on how they've been treating Sonata for years. I think Sonata is maybe the best wrestler they have on that entire roster. And yet, he doesn't get any any recommendation. And he doesn't get, everyone like, yes, this guy is great. Where the hell is his push? He's only ever won tag team titles for the company. He's never been a never openweight champion. He's never been the IWGP heavyweight champion, intercontinental champion, or United States champion. What the hell is the problem with Sonata? Why do they refuse to push him? I don't get it. That's just me complaining about the tournament. I'm still going to watch the last five nights. There's four four nights with the B-block. Three, seven nights. I can't do math off the top of my head. I'm still going to watch the last seven nights and the final. So the last eight shows. Uh, and I know the Royal Quest is maybe a couple weeks after that. Same with TakeOver Cardiff and All Out. That week's podcast is going to be loaded because that's going to drop on Friday. And that would be the 30th, I want to say, off the top of my head. Quickly scroll into my calendar. Like, when is this? Yeah, so that podcast would drop on the 30th, where all the events are on the 31st. So that would be interesting. Um, like I said, G1, it's it's great action, but you just wonder how how is this going to affect in the future? Because... At least you can say with WWE, they push different people. Like, yeah, sometimes we usually see Roman Reigns as the biggest push guy in the company. But yeah, we see Seth Rollins on the top. We see AJ Styles as a dominant force. We see who else? Kofi Kingston has been pushed recently. Daniel Bryan has had a great push. Outside of him not talking now. He's got all these, there's all these little things going on. That would be very interesting, and I'm very excited to see. But... Just just give us somebody else on the top aside from Okada. And to be honest, it could take some big names who have been loyal leaving for them to realize that. And the two, the two names I can think of right away, Sonata and Tetsuya Naito. I've been saying this for a while. I, I can just feel like Sonata's gone. He just doesn't seem like he's into it anymore. He doesn't... Yeah, he gets into it for the crowd, but other than that, he doesn't look enthusiastic anymore. And I know it's it's been a little while, but I know New Japan... Not in Japan. Uh, NXT Japan has kind of been murmured about. I know NXT Canada has been brought up recently, and I think NXT Australia has been somewhat of a talking point, at least from news I've read. So, it would be, if NXT Japan gets started, I guarantee you that would be Sonata out the door. Naito would be a harder sell. Partly because, yes, he's been loyal for so long. He does have an IWGP Heavyweight Championship reign. Although it was a short reign, and the belt just went right back to, guess who? Kazuchika Okada. I'm more curious about Naito, because if he leaves, he's not friends with Omega. Or Cody Rhodes, or the Bucks. It's, that's very obvious. But, does he trust WWE with the character, especially with... Andrade, when he told Roosh, is, I think, real-life relative, if not, they're very, very, very close friends, to not come to WWE because they won't use you correctly. And Roosh signed with Ring of Honor. Would Andrade tell Tetsuya Naito the same thing? He very well could. That's enough about me ranting on the G1, though. That's been about 13 minutes too long. 
or 11 minutes long. I don't know. I'm not good at math or time or anything, really. What the hell am I doing with my life? So, I will say Raw and SmackDown have been very, very interesting these past few weeks, minus the Raw reunion. But the big thing now seems to be we've seen Heyman's fingerprints on the show with Raw. I'm curious if that was Bischoff's fingerprints on the show on SmackDown this week. Although, like I said, Vince, uh, I saw going around Vince McMahon rewrote the entire thing at the last minute. So, I don't know how how much of Bischoff we saw, quote unquote. But it's it's it, it, the build to SummerSlam is somewhat interesting. We've we've got nine matches right now, three women's matches, which could become four, depending on how they play the cards for the women's tag team titles. We could see a triple threat or a fatal four way because. Uh, Bliss did pick up the win over Ember Moon in a women's tag match with Nikki Cross. So they can say they technically have a claim to it. Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville were told they would have a match. They didn't last week. So they could have a claim to a title match. Kyrie Sane and Asuka still have a claim. So we could see four women's matches on the show, which would be great to see. And it's very weird because we don't... The last time, outside of Evolution... I could not tell you the last time we saw a non-title women's match on a pay-per-view. And Charlotte Flair versus Trish Stratus will be very interesting. Because Trish can still go. And to have her in the ring with Charlotte. The only problem is I feel like after watching SmackDown, Trish is going to win. Because how Charlotte said that she would lose in front of her, her, uh, her kids and her country. So it feels like Trish would win. They don't need to build Charlotte up anymore, so I'm fine with Trish winning. But it would be weird because it's another past star winning a match over a future star or a current star. So that's like a weird little feeling about that one. Um, I'm excited for most of the matches on the show so far. I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head. There's only nine. Right now, there's not one I'm not excited about. I like... How Ricochet has another match against uh, AJ Styles. It's very nice to see. Um, I'm curious. There's still some big names now on the show. Roman Reigns. uh, Samoa Joe. Drew McIntyre. So we'll see how those play out. I do have ideas in mind somewhat. So Roman Reigns had the... Whatever is They called it a rig, I think. On social media. He had a rig pushed on top of him to end SmackDown Live, which was a weird way to end the show. You end a wrestling, you end a wrestling show with a backstage segment, really. So there was that. Um, walking away, you saw somebody in a black shirt with gray sleeves. It was quickly, it quickly assumed that it was Buddy Murphy, and somebody was complaining that would be nice to see Roman versus Murphy, but. You just remember Murphy's going to get buried. I don't think that would be a burial at all. Murphy getting to show just how good he is on a big stage. And then probably becoming a more prominent force on SmackDown. Because if rumors are true, and I'll talk about this in a second, the wild card rule is going away, and I cannot tell you how happy I am about that. So, we could see Reigns versus Murphy added to the show. I was thinking it would have been Reigns and Cedric Alexander. Versus Samoa Joe and Drew McIntyre. Or Reigns, Alexander, and the Usos versus McIntyre, Joe, and the OC. Uh, Gallows and Anderson. Which could still happen. I could be completely wrong in assuming it's going to be Reigns versus Murphy. So, we'll see. We'd still have a week. Um, Drew? McIntyre's a tough one. You could see him versus Cedric just on the show in general. Which I wouldn't be mad against, because Cedric Alexander, again, getting a chance to show just how good he is. And Samoa Joe's a weird one, because, like, with Samoa Joe, they need to have him start winning. He needs to start winning matches. That's his big issue. Like He's he's a dominant wrestler. He's a great wrestler. They just don't have him win enough. He barely ever wins a match. I think the best, the best way for Joe to get on the show would be against Roman. But if, it's, if he's going against Murphy, then you can't have him going against Roman. 
which is what I thought the Samoan Summit was going to set up. It would have been Reigns versus Joe at SummerSlam. Now I think about it, Reigns closed both shows this week. He closed Raw with the brawl with everybody I just mentioned, and he closed SmackDown with getting something pushed on top of him. So I'm curious as to what all of them would be doing. I don't know what Joe would be doing. But I look at it, this is the weirdest build to a SummerSlam, because I remember reading, it's, somebody said that it's rumored SummerSlam will be six hours this year. Right now at nine matches, if you give each match ten minutes, it's only 90 minutes, it's only an hour and a half. How can we go from an hour and a half show to six hours? That's five hours, roughly, you have to... No, four and a half. No, five. You take a half, that makes a whole... You, roughly five hours. You have five hours you still have to fill. You add Reigns versus Murphy, there's another ten, so that takes you up to a minute forty. Or an hour forty, excuse me. An hour forty minutes. You add McIntyre versus... Um, what's his face? Alexander. That's an, that's an hour fifty. You add women's tag team, triple threat possibly, which would be another 10. That's an hour 50? An hour 40, an hour 50. So that'd be two hours. Cruiserweights, there's two hours, 10 minutes. Uh, both tag team titles, there's two and a half hours. And you add the IC title, it's 240. That's probably going to be the whole show. So you have two hours and 40 minutes there, but you up into six, a lot of matches are going to get a lot of time, which I'd be very excited to see because like Nakamura versus Ali could go for so long. Oh, Zane Black. That's another one. That'd be almost three hours of wrestling. So you only double each time. So you give each match 20 minutes. There you go. Roughly, depending on backstage bits and whatnot. Like we all know the, um, the WWE and the World Heavyweight Championship are going to get a lot of time. Charlotte versus Trish is going to get plenty of time because both are phenomenal in the ring, no matter how much we hate on Charlotte. She's great in the ring. Um, Reigns versus Murphy could get a lot of time, just so that way they could showcase how good Murphy is. And I think Reigns wouldn't mind doing that. Would he put him over? Hell no. But you could see just how good Murphy is. You could actually give the Cruiserweights time. For once in your goddamn life, Vince, give the Cruiserweights a chance to show just how good they are. Even though right now we don't know because Gulak, because Canales lost on a 205 Live. So right now Gulak doesn't have a challenger. Um, who else could get time? Ali beat Nakamura on SmackDown, which should mean, by wrestling logic, he's in line for a title shot. That could get a lot of time. I want, everybody knows how good Nakamura is. Ali is phenomenal. Let this be the chance for Ali to show you just how good he is and what he could have done in that Elimination Chamber match if he didn't get hurt. I think... I know Owens versus McMahon. That's going to get a lot of time, too. Because it's Shane McMahon, the best in the world. Nobody cares about Shane McMahon anymore. Unless he jumps off of something really tall. Then we all care. Um... SummerSlam is a, in a weird way right now. It, it looks great right now. Problem is, there's still at least three or four matches. At least. Well, let's see. Let's do the math right now. Four titles have yet to be put on the show. Both tag titles, the Intercontinental title, and the five titles. Both, both men's tags, women's tag, the Intercontinental, and the Cruiserweight. Roman's still not on the show. McIntyre's still not on the show. Because it's rumored McIntyre is going to be facing Rollins at Hell in a Cell. So, that's possibly the next pay-per-view. I don't know the WWE calendar off the top of my head. That's five, That's possibly seven matches still added. In a nine, on a nine-match card, you add five. That's 14 matches. That can be a great show or the longest show in history that nobody cares about. Take your pick. And... This is where I say NXT kind of has the the edge over the main roster. With NXT, they have it set. There's a formula. You have five matches, four championships, one non-title. 
Now, in the main roster, you have eight, nine, you have ten titles. You have, you could have a ten match card, which would be not the worst idea. But also, you have at least two non-titles to make up for it. And one would kind of have to be the bridge from world title to world title at the end of the show. Which would be interesting. Um, so, that could work. It would be a, still a really long show, because that's 12 matches still. I'm fine with some titles not being on the show. It's The main roster is hard to figure out. The NXT roster has it perfectly, because the roster is small enough that they can do a five-match show in two and a half hours, or however long the show is. I've never timed an NXT TakeOver. I don't know how long the shows are off the top of my head. You can kind of have that sort of build, and it works perfectly. Whereas with the main roster, you have so many stars trying to get over. You have so much talent trying to get a spot. At first, I had a fatal four-way for the Raw Tag and the uh, Intercontinental Championships. That's still going to be a long show if those are fatal four-ways. Could it be even longer than six hours? It could be longer than WrestleMania for all I know. But we'll see. What's more important, though, is the news coming out of SummerSlam. And that is the fact that the wild card rule might finally be dead. Bring the hallelujah. Bring all the church bells. Doves flying everywhere. This is the greatest news I could have gotten today. So it was reported by... It might have been Brad Shepard. So possibly take this with a grain of salt. But I think I think it was Meltzer that said it first. And Meltzer's sources seem to be more accurate from what I know than Shepard's. So we'll see. I know Sean Ross Sapp usually has really good sources. And he's usually on top of everything. But I believe this one came from Meltzer first. So let's go with... If it's not right, we'll blame Meltzer. Which we do for everything anyway. So nothing changes. Um... He reported that WWE itself, a lot of like people in WWE are upset about the wildcard rule. So after SummerSlam, it will phase out without a wisp, without a noise, essentially, is what I remember reading. Which could not have come at a better time. Because you have all these talents trying to get on the show that need something to do. How do they get on the show... And get something to do if you're using the same talents on the same shows. For example, Roman Reigns closing both Raw and SmackDown. You could have easily given the final spot to whatever the hell the last match was on SmackDown. AJ Styles versus Kofi Kingston. And whatever the hell the last match was on Raw. No, that would have been a very sour note to end on. And I don't think they want to do that all the time. Going into pay-per-view, yeah, that could work. But... I don't think they want to do it every single time. So, God, it's like, if the wild card rule is ending, that is such a great thing to hear. And I do have a pitch for pitch for Raw that I think I would love to see Heyman be in charge of. So you have, you know, you see all these talents running after the 24-7 championship. Every single week we have like a backstage Benny Hill sequence where you have the playing in the background essentially. Imagine if, for the first hour, we had however many matches, two, three matches, possibly. You can go four and give each one 20 minutes. You have eight guys. Or you, have, and you have matches where it's people right now with no storyline, no build, nothing. They get to have a match. You give them a certain amount of time. They go out there, they do their match, and you go based off of what the fans' reaction is. If it's a great reaction, they start to get used a little more. If it's not the best reaction, then you can go back to the drawing board and say, okay, why doesn't this work? What could we do differently to make this work? Look at the likes of Mojo Rawley, uh, Bobby Roode. Who else has not been used recently? The Ascension. Uh, Ryder and Hawkins. You do you work with them on those sh- on that show, and you have them open the show for the first hour, as to what 
that's to, hey, look at this. We can wrestle too. And then you have like people get into programs and then you see the likes of maybe a Ricochet if he has nothing to do. Maybe Cesaro. You, ha- you would have like guys who are in feuds currently go back down there so that way they can still wrestle and be on TV and be seen. But not just eat pinfall losses and random moments in matches. And now you can also look at... Uh, the, so how that would be the first hour. Now, how do you tackle the second and third hour? That would be simple. The second and third hour are used for story building purposes. So you would have, you know, your world championship feuds during the during the final two hours. You would have the mid card feuds in the final two hours, the tag title feuds in the final two hours. The actual feuds you are building to a pay per view payoff. You have at those points, which I think would be a great idea. That's me, though. There's still a bajillion other people who probably have different ideas. But it would get talent on the air that it hasn't been on the air recently. They would be allowed to wrestle and actually show just how good they are. And then they can go and work on their um, on their feuds in the last two-thirds of the show. Which would be a great idea and something they could build off of. So, that's... That's raw. SmackDown will be tougher because SmackDown's only two hours. Two or five live is an easy fix to me. Put it back at put it at full sale and have it taped. Done. There you go. I'm a genius. I'm not, but that's my idea. NXT and NXT UK are perfect as they are. So that's like a, an idea now that the wild card rule is ending. And then you can also kind of build up certain stars too. Which would be nice to see. So for example, I think Samoa Joe could be a multi-time world champion by now if they had just booked him correctly. And they don't, which makes me upset. There's, there's a lot to fix, but like I said, NXT is good as it is. But there are NXT call-ups, and I'm going to get to that. I'm just more excited right now for the future of Raw and SmackDown now the wild card rule is over. So let's just see how how they're going to kind of work that and make it how it is. And see now, what, what do they do? Where do they go? What could it be? It's, it's a weird time in wrestling, like I said. There's nothing really going on, and we get news like this, and we can talk about it. So, as I mentioned, NXT call-ups. Usually we get a lot of them post-WrestleMania. This year we got Aleister Black, Ricochet, officially on the main roster. We had War Raiders, I'm sorry, Viking Raiders, I think. Yeah, Viking Raiders. And I could be wrong with that was it. Cedric Alexander and Buddy Murphy got called up, but that's from 205 Live. So now how, with SummerSlam coming up, this is the one of the big four. SummerSlam, Survivor Series, Royal Rumble, WrestleMania. There are two names that I think could be getting called up now. And to be fair, it's time. They've done literally everything they can do in NXT. So now they have to tackle the main roster. That's all they have left. That's Shayna Baszler and Johnny Gargano. This kind of spoils two of my picks for next week. Yes, I'm going with Adam Cole, and yes, I'm going with Mia Yim. But there is good reason. Like I said, both of them have done everything they can in NXT. That it's time for them to go over to the main roster and shine there. And it's easy. It would be one for Raw, one for SmackDown. None of the tag teams are ready yet. Maybe, I know Oni Lorcan has been on 205 Live, but maybe we start to see Danny Burch over there. Which would be nice to see. Uh, and they both still wrestle on NXT now still. Or as, as well. So... That would be very nice to see, and I'd be very enjoy. I'd be very happy to see that. So, you would have only two call ups. It's easy. Baszler goes to Raw. Uh, Johnny Gargano goes to SmackDown. And I have my reasoning. Let's let's start with Shayna Baszler. Baszler has run rough shot through the NXT Women's Division. She's beaten literally everybody except for Aaliyah, Vanessa Bourne, 
Casey Catanzaro and Mia Yim for her title. Aaliyah Catanzaro and Vanessa Bourne are not ready yet. Bourne and Aaliyah seem more focused on a tag team right now, which I'm totally fine with. It gives them something to do, too. But that seems to be what they're thinking, or what my thinking is. I said this the same. Uh, NXT TakeOver, where was it? New York. I thought for sure Baszler was losing the title. It was three on one. She was the only heel. It was the perfect time. And you could have put the title on Io Shirai, but we wouldn't have gotten badass Io Shirai like we have now that I freaking love. So we'll see where that goes with Io there. But Yim would take the title from Baszler, and it's the perfect person to take it from her. I mean, they live together, I believe. I think it's her, it's Baszler, Yim, and... Whichever one is not married to Roderick Strong, I think it's Marina Shafir. I'm not sure, though. But we could see Baszler on Raw. And here's the reason. Now, automatically, you're going to think, oh, Baszler on Raw. She's going immediately after Becky. Could be true. But how about this? We don't know when Sasha Banks is coming back. If she's coming back. So... How would, well, the Raw Division as it is for the women, it's not really a challenge for Becky. There's nobody really there that's a big threat to Becky Lynch. So, you build up Shayna Baszler throughout the entire rest of the summer and winter. Maybe she wins the women's Royal Rumble match. Other than it had to go on first, and it went on first last year, so it feel like you're kind of, I don't know. Maybe she wins the Women's Royal Rumble match. Maybe she just kind of earns the right for WrestleMania. You could have Becky drop it there and not look bad. You would have built Shayna Baszler up so well. Although I hope it's Ruby Riot that wins the title from her. Just saying. But I, I think it would be a right idea. It would be a good idea. She's a legitimate person who could rip your head off if she wanted to. And they want legitimacy. Shayna Baszler would make the most sense. And in a weak division, where right now, if if Sasha Banks is not back, I don't see who takes the title from Becky Lynch. I literally don't see a name. The SmackDown division, women's division is stacked. Bailey, Ember Moon, Asuka, Kyrie Sane, Charlotte Flair, Carmella. That's six right there. You could have your own SmackDown Women's Elimination Chamber match. With those six. And it'd be a fantastic match. Who else is on SmackDown Lynch card that I forgot? Sonya Deville, Mandy Rose, um, Liv Morgan. I'm trying to remember them all now. I think I got them all. Aside from Zelina Vega, she doesn't wrestle as much, which is annoying, but what can you do? So, Baszler's the easy sell. The tough one's Gargano. Now, he would go to SmackDown because he's a great wrestler, first of all, and he... He might end up on 205 Live. I don't think he's a... He's a too big of a name, I think. There's a reason Buddy Murphy, Cedric Alexander, and Mustafa Ali, or now Ali, uh, left 205 Live. They got too big. They were such a big name. They couldn't just be on 205 Live anymore. They had to do something else, too. That is why we see Buddy Murphy and Ali on SmackDown and Cedric Alexander on Raw. Kalisto... Incinerado and Grand Metal League are just kind of there because they needed a tag team for something, and they're like, well, these guys are good. We should at least give them more chances, which I'm totally fine with. So, now with Johnny Gargano, it's a stacked SmackDown division as it is. He would have to work his way up. Maybe, maybe because SmackDown lacks tag teams, you start him in a tag team, and I don't know why the First name that came to my head with Johnny Gargano to team with, if he's in the tag team division, Apollo Crews. They both wrestled for Dragon Gate at different times, and Johnny Gargano, I think, was mainly Dragon Gate USA. I believe they wrestled each other in Evolve. They, they have a history together, I think. Not the not the close-knit, like, tight history that some people, some wrestlers have together, but they have a history enough. Where you can connect the dots and it works. At least to me. So, 
I think that would be a good place to start Gargano. Of course, he wouldn't stay there. Of course, I mean, outside of New Day and Heavy Machinery, the SmackDown Tag Division really sucks. You have the B team, but they're busy with the 24-7 title skits. You have... Uh, I think that's it. You have three teams. So you put Gargano with... Uh, what's his face? Apollo Crews. It can work for a little while. And then Gargano and Crews eventually go on to the mid card. And imagine a big pay-per-view match. Gargano, Nakamura, Intercontinental Championship. Or even at that point, say, say Ali wins it from Nakamura at SummerSlam. I don't think. I have to think on that one. That one's a tough one. I don't think it would be, but if he does, then you could have Ali eventually drop the title to Andrade. Now imagine Andrade versus Johnny Gargano. Again! They went, with, they went 43 minutes to take over. They got the first five star match rating in NXT in WWE history since Gargano, since um, Punk versus Cena. So you would finally get that, which would be nice. I do think Gargano might have to wait a little bit in the world title scene on SmackDown because of a certain Roman Reigns. I know that the Fox deal that Roman's a big draw. I, I personally think us, like, Diehard wrestling fans who watch way too much wrestling for our own good could feasibly see Gargano beating beating Roman Reigns. But I don't know if WWE could see it feasibly. So they had to get it on a smarmy heel. When I said smarmy heel, the first name that came in my head was Dolph Ziggler. I don't want to see Dolph Ziggler as WWE champion in 2019. Hell, even not, not even 2020. Definitely not 2020. Who's a good smarmy heel? Elias isn't big enough of a name. Kevin Owens is a face now, so he's out. Because I think it would be too early to turn him back heel. Um, um, Nakamura, but he's busy with the Intercontinental title. Andrade. You know, it could be Andrade. Who else is even really a smarmy heel? Daniel Bryan. There's still the whole shakeup to think about, too. But right now, my thought for Gargano would be SmackDown. I have him start in the tag team division just so that way he has something to do. And it would be an easy spot to put somebody in because, outside, like I said, outside of Heavy Machinery, B-Team, and New Day, I couldn't name you another SmackDown tag team. So we'll see with that. Um, I do think n next week's a big week, so I'm going to keep this week short. Um, I know I didn't talk about it too much, but like I said, it's been a quiet week. Um... AEW hasn't done much. They announced a match for All In. I think they announced Havoc versus Allen versus Janela, which is going to be a good match, I think. Those those three could all really do really well together. Um, I think that was the match they announced. That was the most recent one I remember seeing on Wikipedia, that, which is where I go for the match cards. Um, so, yeah, we talked about the G1. We talked about how Raw and SmackDown are going to get better and all that good jazz. Talked about NXT call-ups coming up after SummerSlam. And next week, very, very, very big, very busy. We got SummerSlam predictions. We're going to have NXT TakeOver Toronto predictions. I'm going to be tired that whole week. I don't care. I probably have work at 6 a.m. the Monday after SummerSlam. So hopefully it's a good start time. I'm, I'm hoping 7 o'clock. Because 6 o'clock, 6 is asking too much. 6 for a pre-show, though, would work for perfectly. 7 o'clock for the main show, and if it's 6 hours, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1. Maybe it's a 6 o'clock start. I don't know. I don't know about time. But we'll see. We'll have all those predictions next week. We'll have, I believe, the finals on the 12th. Wait, when is, when is SummerSlam? SummerSlam is next week. Right? Yeah, the 11th. So we're going to have the final G1 wrap-up. We'll have SummerSlam and TakeOver predictions. And then we'll see where we go for the summer stretch. Because we're almost done with the summer stretch in pro wrestling. Which means the next real big thing to look forward to is Survivor Series. The start of uh, Wednesday Night Dynamite on TNT. SmackDown's move to Fox. 
and World Tag League in the winter. Hopefully World Tag League is actually good this year. I want more teams besides G.O.D. and Sonata and Evil to be the focus of New Japan. Um, and like I always say, I want to get more into more wrestling. I just need, you know, time. I have a podcast to record. I have school. I have work. I have a paper to write for. I have articles to write for the website. I have this podcast. I think I might have already said that. I have a social life, surprisingly. So we'll see. I'll have to figure all that stuff out. But... That's all next week. Like I said, three times now. Predictions. Final G1 wrap-up. Because I should have it done after I watch the G1. I don't know the G1 schedule, top of my head. I keep delaying the end of this podcast. But it's a really easy, quick look-up. The last G1 show is the 11th. Never mind, I won't have it done yet, then. Uh, we'll have it, We'll know one of the block winners, at least. So at least SummerSlam is also on the 12th. If I'm not right about that... Why am I looking it up on Cage Match? I just had the Wikipedia article still open. I should. Um, but, 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 uh, this G1... Don't do that. Stop at home. Uh, SummerSlam 2019. August 11th, yeah. So, at that point... We would know both finalists. And I can make my finals prediction before the... Oh, I do it on Friday. I won't know the finalists yet unless they figure it out early. Okay, I keep. I'm just rambling now. Um, to wrap up this podcast, uh, as always, Twitter re shout outs. Um, before, like I said earlier at the po- at the beginning of this podcast, uh, I'm on Twitter at Jerry Solider. Follow this podcast at Podcast Armchair. Follow all things combat on Twitter at Things Combat. We'll recover professional wrestling, MMA, and boxing. Currently, still finishing up our SummerSlam reviews. Uh, we're going to probably be doing triple coverage, triple coverage of Takeover Cardiff, uh, Royal Quest, and All Out on August thirty first. I'm promoting that now. It's not even August yet when I'm recording this. It is July thirty first. Um, you can follow the newspaper I write for at CSU Cauldron, and we'll start having articles posted on there. And news and information if you're in the Cleveland area and if you graduate, if you are going to Cleveland State uh, and you are interested in journalism or just writing in general, uh, be sure to uh, contact one of us, which would be nice. Uh, yeah, those are the four uh, Twitters. Uh, all, as always, if you want to, please subscribe to this channel. Please, please com- comment if you want, like if you want. Talk to me about it if you want. I know I've seen like some of you are active about it and talk about it, which is nice. But like I said I just do this one for fun. I don't. It's not like a means to an end. I don't do this to earn a buck or anything. This is just me sharing my thoughts about pro wrestling and me just enjoying having a good chat with myself and having you guys all hear it. Uh, but yeah, if you feel like it, go ahead and subscribe. Hit that like button. Let me know what you thought. What are your thoughts? Uh, are Raw and SmackDown going to get better now? Especially the wildcard rules gone. How do you feel about the G1? And who do you think is going to get the call after SummerSlam? The call to the main roster and hopefully not get buried. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Like I said, it's going to be a short one. I will see you guys next week with Prediction Galore. See you guys then. Later. <laughs>